Welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Ted Peterson, and I am a professor of computer science at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And today is Monday, July 18th, 2016, which means, um, I just decided this this morning actually, that today is the Ada Lovelace Festival of Books, uh, here in Duluth at least. And mind you, it's not a book festival, it is a festival of books. And so the genesis of this uh, has been some fairly extensive reading that I've been doing about Ada Lovelace over the last probably six to eight months. And I've reached a point where I feel like I've read quite a bit of what there is to read, certainly not everything, but I've kind of reached a saturation point, and so I wanted to share some thoughts about what I've read and um, record those here so that I can maybe view this later on and remember what I thought. Um, and maybe you can get some ideas too. Um, and so Ada Lovelace is an important figure in computer science. Um, she's interesting for a lot of reasons, but she's often referred to as the first computer programmer. And she uh, is, uh, uh, was, a, was a colleague of Charles Babbage, uh, who uh, in the 18 period, 1820s to 1840s, 1850s, uh, was involved in designing uh, first his difference engine and then his more general analytical engine, which is often said to be a forerunner of modern computing. Uh, right, rightfully so, I would say. And Ada Lovelace uh, worked with uh, Charles Babbage, um, and for those, and for that reason, for that collaboration, is why we know about her in computer science. Now, as you read about her, it turns out her life had a lot of interesting aspects that extend way beyond uh, computer science. But, um, you know, certainly I first became aware of her uh, due to not just her work with Charles Babbage, but, uh, but this, this paper, let's see here if I can do this. Uh, it's called A Sketch of the Analytical Engine Invented by Charles Babbage. And this is a paper in two parts, really. Uh, the first is an um, uh, article by um, uh, Manabria, who uh, attended a lecture by Charles Babbage in Italy in 1840 and transcribed some notes of that. And Ada Lovelace became the translator of that, translator from French into English. And as a part of her translation, she appended uh, to Manabria's notes, uh, to his work, to his, to his uh, article, she appended voluminous notes, um, notes by the translator. And um, you can find uh, this paper on, online very easily uh, if you just search for a sketch of the analytical engine. You'll find it right away. And we'll note that the notes appended to the paper are actually like twice as long as the paper itself. And these notes were written in the period of around 1841, 1842. Um, so we're talking about 170 years ago, I believe. And it's, it's really kind of startling. When I, when I first read these, I was really kind of struck by the clarity of thought that they expressed. And the very modern notion of computing that they captured. Um, if, if I had not, I, you know, if I, if I hadn't known the background of this, of this paper um, when I read it, I, I wouldn't have guessed that it was written in the 1840s. I mean, I just, I just wouldn't have. Um, and so um, she does a number of important things in this paper. Uh, and, and one of them is to lay out very clearly the differences between Charles Babbage's difference engine and his analytical engine. And, you know, th this is a point of confusion. The difference engine was a, really a calculator. Um, it, it could compute approximations for polynomial expressions using the method of finite differences. And it's a brilliant, uh, it's a brilliant device. Um, and the, the engineering and, and the, the ways that these calculations are done are really kind of stunning. Um, but it's not the analytical engine. And, and what Ada Lovelace really, really thought about and worked with was more so the analytical engine, which was a general purpose computing device. Uh, this developed, uh, you know, and envisioned by Charles Babbage 
you know, 30, 40 years before electricity. Um, you know, at the time the, the telegraph uh, was being invented, Charles Babbage was thinking about essentially this kind of steam-powered computing device, uh, which included really all the components of what we consider to be a modern computing device um, today. Um, and so Charles Babbage's, you know, vision, uh, you know, was kind of extraordinary. And in Ada Lovelace, he found uh, someone who could share that vision and even expand on it. And that's, what, that's a lot of what we see in these notes. And, 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 and what we see there is, is really, you know, as, as I say, it's kind of remarkable, very exciting. And so um, there are just a few, a few places um, I, would, I, I want to share a couple of things that Ada Lovelace wrote. Uh, for us here. And I guess what I would say here is the reason I'm starting with this paper is that if, if you're going to read one thing by or about Ada Lovelace, this is it. I mean, this is why we know her. This is important. It stands on its own. And uh, so I'm going to talk about a lot of books and things here, but, but if, there's, if you're going to pick one, yeah, just read this. You know, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy it. And, um, and so uh, she divided her notes into a series of, um, a series of notes, um, enumerated A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And in note A, note A is the longest, and that's where she really goes into a rather detailed differentiation of the difference engine and the analytical engine. And she was doing this for a few reasons. One is that, like today, people get confused by this, um, or could be confused by this. And she was also trying to help her friend uh, and colleague, Charles Babbage, by explaining the difference to people. Because his difference engine had been funded by the British government to an enormous extent. Um, you know, it's, it's you know, thousands upon thousands of pounds. It's often said that the amount of money the British government gave to Charles Babbage to build or to design even a difference engine uh, was about the same cost it would take to build a battleship. And so, um, and that raises kind of an important point about the difference engine and the analytical engine. Neither of those were ever built um, in Babbage's or Lovelace's lifetime. The analytical engine to date has not been built. The, the difference engine has only recently been reconstructed from Charles Babbage's plans in the 1990s. Um, and I think that work was in the 1980s, 1990s. And so you can actually see a working difference engine as Babbage envisioned. Uh, there's one at the Computer History Museum in California. There's a lot of videos you can see that show it. And it's really remarkable. Um, and it's important to remember that that is not the analytical engine. Uh, the analytical engine, we do not have a working model of that or a, a reconstruction of it, um, although there are some efforts underway to, to try and provide that. Um, but in any case, she was trying to make the case for Babbage that his analytical engine was something very different and very important and that it was worthy of funding and uh, support regardless of you know what people thought of the difference engine. And so, uh, so just a, a one point she makes in making this case um, is that um, uh, she, she described the difference engine essentially as a kind of calculating engine and then goes on to say uh, the bounds of arithmetic were however outstepped the moment the idea of applying the cards had occurred. Uh, these are punch cards essentially to represent input and output, a, a, a concept that we saw in computing in the 1940s and 1950s, 1960s and mainframe computers. Um, in any case, and the analytical engine does not occupy common ground with mere calculating machines like the difference engine, she's saying. It holds a position wholly its own, and the considerations it suggests are most interesting in their nature. In enabling mechanism to combine together general symbols and successions of unlimited variety and extent, a uniting link is established between the operations of matter and the abstract mental processes of the most abstract branch of mathematical science. A new, a vast, and a powerful language is developed for the future use of analysis in which to wield its truth so that these may become of more speedy and accurate practical application for the purposes of mankind than the means hitherto in our possession have rendered possible. 
Thus, not only the mental and the material, but the theoretical and the practical and the mathematical world are brought into more intimate and effective connection with each other. We are not aware of its being on record that anything partaking in the nature of what is so well designed, the analytical engine, has been hitherto proposed or even thought of as a practical possibility any more than the idea of a thinking or of a reasoning machine. So she's talking here about general purpose computing in a way that we didn't see developed until the late 1940s after World War II. I mean, a hundred years ahead uh, of, this, um, of, of this possibility even. Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace were designing and talking about and describing what that would look like. Um, now she goes on in, these, in, this, in her notes to, to talk about the possibilities of the analytical engine, the, the, the differences with the difference engine. She talks about solving problems with the analytical engine and shows uh, and lays out in kind of step-by-step -step fashion a uh, solution to, for example, Bernoulli equations, which is where her kind of her title of the first programmer comes from. And, and at, along the way, she engages in these kind of very um, sort of exciting visions of, 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 of computing that we don't, um, um, you, you know, we, we have a, we, I have a hard time sometimes realizing that she was talking about and, 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 and thinking about these ideas without the benefit of any kind of working machine to, um, to, to test them on. And yet, um, they're so clearly described that, um, you know, you, can, you, you really get a sense that she had a great grasp of what computing could do in general. Um, note, D, note G, the last G, includes some thoughts that um, uh, are important about computing in general, then and now. And she starts that section, or that note, by saying, it is desirable to guard against the possibility of exaggerated ideas that might arise as to the powers of the analytical engine. In considering any new subject, there is frequently a tendency, first, to overrate what we find to be already interesting or remarkable, and secondly, by a sort of natural reaction, to undervalue the true state of the case when we do discover that our notions have surpassed those that were readily that were really tenable. The analytical engine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power anticipating any analytical relations or truths. And its province is to assist us in making available what we are already acquainted with. And this is a stunningly, I would say, contemporary notion about computing and the limits uh, of computing. We, we hear a lot of hyperbole uh, today in, in the media about you know, artificial intelligence, computers taking over the world and stuff. And here's Ada Lovelace from 170 years ago reminding us, you know what, these machines actually do what we tell them to do. And you know what, that's the truth. Um, she's right about that. And this is a particularly important point uh, from my perspective in that Alan Turing in the 1940s uh, and, and early 1950s uh, was conceiving of his idea of a test to see if computers could really think. And in his paper about that idea, a 1950 paper, he talks about a number of objections to the idea of, a, uh, of the Turing test, that is a kind of dialogue between a human and a computer where if the computer can fool the human that it too is human maybe that means the computer's intelligence. One of the objections to that idea that he discusses at some length is what he refers to as Ada Lo um, Lady Lovelace's objection. And it's that point that a, that a computer doesn't really originate anything. And Turing talks about that idea and sort of fleshes it out a bit. And I think um, in, in that moment, we see a, a, a kind of remarkable meeting of minds between Ada Lovelace and Alan Turing across a span of a hundred years and uh, at least to me you, you, the fact that Alan Turing found her ideas, discussed them at such length, I think is tremendously validating um, because Alan Turing is, you know, he's no slouch, I mean, as far as computing goes, right? He's uh, really credited with uh, establishing the rigorous foundations of, of theoretical computing and also doing, you know, brilliant work 
in the design and engineering of some of the first stored program computers, um, which I've, I've talked about elsewhere, um, and, and so won't launch off into that again. But in any case, um, I think that connection with Alan Turing here, I think, is real important. Um, and I think, I think it's especially important because for whatever reason, um, there's a lot of controversy about Ada Lovelace and how much she really knew, how much she really contributed to this article. And there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of critics who say, well, no, she didn't really originate anything. She, she just kind of copied stuff Babbage gave her and things like that. And it's, it's a real kind of dismissive, ugly kind of argument that um, uh, you, you see playing out in some of the things that um, I'm going to talk about, some of, the, some of the books and such that I'm going to talk about here. Um, but I think for me, um, first, that connection with Alan Turing is, 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 is so important. Um, you know, this kind of validation of, of one of her ideas. Um, and then secondly, just my own, you know, response to this article is, as someone who, you know, I guess I know about computer science, reading it and feeling this kind of clarity of vision um, 170 years on, um, I mean, that, that, that's made a tremendous impression on me. Um, and then, you know, maybe we need to listen to the man himself, Charles, Charles Babbage. And Charles Babbage, oh my gosh, what a, what a fascinating man he is. He's worth his own long, winding video about his long, winding life. He was a, a clearly a very brilliant man, very capable man, who had a lot of ideas, a lot of interests, did not have the inclination to write or publish much about particularly his difference in analytical engine. And so that's part of why this is such an important paper. We don't have a lot by Charles Babbage otherwise. And so there's, a, there's an aspect to this criticism of Ada Lovelace that I, that I think is so disingenuous. It's like, well, Charles Babbage didn't write anything. She wrote this. I mean, had she not written this, we would know much less about the analytical engine and the difference engine than we do today. And he made that choice not to write. He, had the, he, he was a wealthy man. He had time for many interests. He could have written a lot and, and maybe sorted this out. But you know what? Let's give credit to the person that actually wrote this stuff down, and that's Ada Lovelace. And to suggest that she was merely a kind of secretary, I think, I think is, is very much disproven by the correspondence between Lovelace and Babbage that exists. Um, and also Babbage's own remarks. In his own, he has a, a biography, autobiography, Passages from the Life of a Philosopher. And it's about everything. It's, it's all over the place, but it's, it's a wonderful picture of, of, a, of a kind of remarkable and, and, and fascinating man. And so what he says in this book about the um, Manabria paper is that um, um, what he, he says here, the elementary principles on which the analytical engine rests were thus in the first instance brought before the public by General Manabria. And that's the, um, you know, that's this, his, his, his article uh, based on Babbage's lecture, which was translated by Ada Lovelace. Um, and then um, uh, he, Babbage goes on to say, sometime after the appearance of his memoir on the subject, um, the late Countess of Lovelace informed me that she had translated the memoir of Manabria. I asked why she had not herself written an original paper on a subject with with which she was so intimately acquainted. To this, Lady Lovelace, to, to this Lady Lovelace replied that she had not, the thought had not occurred to her. I then suggested that she should add some notes to Manabria's memoir, an idea which was immediately adopted. Uh, we discussed together the various illustrations that might be introduced. I suggested several, but the selection was entirely her own. So also was the algebraic working out of the different problems um, Ex indeed, except indeed that relating to the numbers of Bernoulli, which I had offered to do to save Lady Lovelace the trouble. This she sent back to me for an, for an amendment, having detected a grave mistake which I had made in the process. Um, the, um, the notes of the Countess of Lovelace extend to about three times the length of the original memoir. Their author has entered fully into almost all the very difficult and abstract questions connected with the subject. So, Babbage 
is pretty clearly saying here this was, you know, this was Ada Lovelace's. She did a lot on this. And so why this has become an issue uh, and a, a subject of debate, I can only speculate about. I, 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 will, I will resist that, but there are the, you know, some obvious concerns um, about Ada Lovelace as a, as a woman uh, and, and perhaps as a, as, a, as a wealthy, aristocratic woman uh, a, a, and a woman who died young. She died at 36 and so did not have time in life to go on to kind of cement her reputation. This, this is what we have from her. Um, this was published about 10 years before her death, so when she was in, she was working on this when, when she was in her mid to late 20s. Um, but in addition to working with Charles Babbage, she was a, uh, a wife, a mother of three children, um, and as we'll see, the daughter of a, a rather challenging mother and a, uh, a father, an absent father, and we'll get into all of this. Um, so, um, so, so this is why we in computer science know about Ada Lovelace. There's an Ada Lovelace Day on December 10th, which commemorates the day of her birth um, in 1815. And so uh, we've passed, you know, we're at about 150, the 152nd birthday, if you will, will be coming up. And I would encourage you on December 10th to take a moment and, uh, you know, do a little reading or thinking about Ada Lovelace. Um, I, I feel like she deserves a day. Um, but some people even quarrel with that, and, and you know, you'll see examples of that here, I guess, as we go along. Um, so in any case, um, as I began to, to learn a little bit more about Ada Lovelace, what I realized was that, first, there is a lot of controversy. Um, and, and so I thought, well, let me find sort of a, a defining biography. I love biographies. I read, I read a lot of biographies. I really like biographies. And sometimes, you know, for, for a certain figure, there will be a biography that just kind of nails it. It gives you their life, and it puts it in perspective. And it, it, it kind of irons out some of the controversy that may exist about a person and so forth. Um, Alan Turing has a biography like that. The biography by Andrew Hodges is... Um, you know, it, it's, it's a complete accounting of his life or as much as can be expected in biography, and it's the one place to go. When I began looking about for more information about Ada Lovelace, what I realized is that she doesn't really have that kind of biography. Not yet. She has, there's a lot written about Ada Lovelace, but it, 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 it comes at her from various perspectives, and I never felt like I was really getting one sort of clear accounting of her and her life that kind of helped to put her in some kind of perspective. And so I'm going to talk about sort of my journey here. And I've, I've there's a bunch of biographies that I've read that I have arranged here chronologically from oldest to newest. Doesn't mean that I'm, I read that, I, I did not read them in that order. And it doesn't mean that there aren't other biographies out there. There certainly are. But these are some of the ones that I was able to find and that I, you know, that I read and that I, I, I wanted to, to, to share with you. And one of the, um, so, so one, of the, one of the earlier ones, at least, that I encountered was published in 1977. And this is called um, Ada, Countess of Lovelace, Byron's Legitimate Daughter. Wow. And the author, uh, Doris Langley Moore. And so I remember when I ran across this title. Uh, this book comes to us actually from the Duluth Public Library. I'm a great fan of the Duluth Public Library. And guess what? They have this book. So, so kudos to them. Um, here's Ada Lovelace. You know, uh, icon in computer science, I would say. And the subtitle of, of this biography is Byron's Legitimate Daughter. And I have to admit, I didn't get the whole connection to Lord Byron. I did not understand why that mattered. I'm, you know, my knowledge of British literature is sort of my own selective um, reading, and I, I have not, I had not previously encountered Lord Byron. I didn't quite get the significance of Lord Byron. But guess what? A lot of the biographies that you see about Ada Lovelace, especially, well, for example, this one. 
Um, it, it's, it's a lot about Lord Byron and his wife, Ada Lovelace's mother, Annabelle Milbank. Um, they had a really kind of poor marriage, I would say, to put it, to put it mildly. Lord Byron, um, many people know a lot more about Lord Bar Byron than I do, but he, he was a, a poet. Um, of, of him famously said, mad, bad, and dangerous to know by one of his uh, romantic interests, I believe. And so he was a bit of a, a, bit of a rascal, um, which minimizes it a bit. He was a philanderer and all sorts of, all sorts of things. And, and I think has a kind of a, a, a you know, there's a, there's a sort of almost like a cult-like following of people that are really interested in Lord Byron even still. And indeed, if you look at, you know, if you read his poetry, it, it is, yeah, I mean, there's some, I mean, it, it's good, I mean, right? I mean, even I can see that. And so Lord Byron um, married Annabelle Milbank uh, in early 1815. Uh, why they married is a subject of great interest and speculation for scholars of Byron and so forth. Um, and Annamella Milbank was a, a wealthy young woman. Um, she was a smart woman. She, she had studied, she knew mathematics. Um, and uh, it's been suggested that perhaps Lord Byron was attracted to her because of her wealth. Um, and Annabella Milbank may have seen him as a bit of a project and maybe she could reform him in some way or, you know, who knows. In any case, their marriage did not last long at all. Um, uh, Lord Byron was uh, apparently a somewhat indifferent and uh, unfaithful husband even in a few months um, of marriage. And so um, uh, they, they, you know, by the time that Ada Lovelace was born. Uh, the, I mean, the, the marriage ended soon after her birth, and Ada Lovelace never actually met her father, Lord Byron. He was he was an absent figure in her life uh, because of the nature of the failed relationship. Um, Annabella Milbank, who henceforth we'll call Lady Byron, Lady Byron uh, was bitter and spent much of the rest of her life convincing the world, convincing her daughter that Lord Byron was just basically an evil person. And um, uh, so what a, fi what a family dynamic. I mean, uh, Ada Lovelace grew up without a father and grew up with a mother who was, um, by many accounts, a very, a very strong and kind of domineering personality. Um, who was quite focused on herself um, and uh, so was a, a somewhat absent mother. Um, now there's some discussion of whether or not she was that different than other sort of aristocratic mothers of the day. Um, I, I'm not going to get into that at all, but you know the fact was Ada Lovelace grew up as a certainly a privileged child, but also a very lonely child, and a child who really did not have a, a family surrounding her. Um, Doris Langley Moore uh, is a, a, was, I believe she's deceased now, was a, a scholar of Lord Byron, and so this book is very much focused on Lord Byron, Annabella Milbank, and sort of the fallout of that relationship and uh, does not get so much into Ada's scientific or technical work like this, um, but certainly gives us a, a rather vivid picture of, of Lady Byron, um, Ada's, Ada's mother. And so, for example, um, one uh, description um, <laughs> about uh, uh, Doris uh, Langley Moore is, is she doesn't she doesn't mess around, um, and so talking about Ada's mother, she says, Lady Byron. But if this Ada could not be aware, had been on the verge of death for years, and would live to what in those days uh, would be the ripe old age of sixty-eight. Um, <laughs> and so, um, while she was only twenty-two, her future husband uh, had expressed uneasiness at her being taken ill once in every three days during their courtship. Um, and um, uh, and so on. Um, and so Doris uh, Langley Moore concludes from this and other things that, 
uh, Lady Byron was, in short, a most persuasive hypochondriac whose maladies occupied a large proportion of her letters and evoked the constant solicitude of nearly everyone who corresponded with her and who kept the doctors busy wherever she went, prescribing the draconian remedies she demanded. By her own desire, she was often bled or cupped. Her faith in bleeding was such that on one occasion she put a leech inside her mouth, causing her lip to turn black. So, this is Lady Byron, um, a woman uh, no doubt poorly treated by Lord Byron, uh, you know, and, and, and no doubt she entered that relationship in good faith, but also a woman who tended apparently to um, kind of emphasizing her own maladies to the exclusion of others. And this, this would play itself out later on in Ada Lovelace's life. When, when Ada Lovelace may have inherited some of her mother's hypochondria, but she also, in the end, died of uterine cancer at 36. So she really was, at a point in her life, sick. And even at that time, Lady Byron, it can still be seen in her letters, emphasizes her own maladies over those of her daughter. So, I mean, that's a tough dynamic. Um, and so, um, one fact we have to keep in mind, too, about Ada Lovelace is that during her life, um, the fact that she was Lord Byron's daughter was, everyone knew this, everyone cared about it, and it was, to some extent, what she was known for. And so, when, um, when Ada Lovelace was married uh, in her teens to, uh, to Lord King, um, uh, there was an article... Uh, in the world of fashion that reported, the fair Augusta Ada Byron, Ada, sole daughter of my house and heart, has become the wife of Lord King. And so that Ada, sole daughter of my house and heart, is a line from one of Lord Byron's, you know, very famous uh, works. And uh, in that work, written after, obviously after Ada was born and after the separation from um, Lady Byron, he talks very um, passionately about Ada and about his, his love for his absent daughter. And now whether or not that was genuine or was a kind of theatrical flourish, dramatic, you know, dramatic flourish of some sort, uh, we can't know. Uh, but Lady Byron took the inclusion of Ada in Lord Byron's work as kind of a challenge and began to to create her own narrative about Lord Byron and his misdeeds, and in particular focused on an alleged um, incestuous relationship that Lord Byron had with his um, half-sister, um, Augusta, which led to the, 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 a child being born, uh, Medora. And whether or not Medora was clearly Lord Byron's child or not, I don't know that that's been resolved, but my gosh, we have here everything for a, just a, a, a spellbinding drama. And, and for many people, this whole connection with Lord Byron, Lady Byron, Medora, the illegitimate daughter, Ada, the legitimate daughter, this dominates what many people think about when they think about Ada Lovelace. And so this is a, um, this, this book, this is actually, it's a really interesting biography and it, 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 it relies quite a lot on correspondence from Lady Byron and um, includes f from Ada Lovelace as well. Um, they were, to our good fortune, um, prolific letter writers. Uh, both Ada and her mother wrote lots and lots of letters, and many of those have been preserved. So we actually have a lot of Ada Lovelace in her own words um, beyond this paper. And those letters are really kind of fascinating. And one, all of the biographies tend to rely on those to some extent. But what's, what's interesting is that there are so many of these letters that you can't possibly include all of them in any one place. And so we get um, rather different shadings of, of what the truth probably is, depending on what the author uh, of the biography kind of is, is focusing on. And so that's, that's what makes arriving at kind of a, a generic conclusion about her life rather difficult. Um, and um, so Doris Langley Moore, uh, clearly uh, 
you know, this biography is 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 very sympathetic to Ada. Uh, it it certainly uh, describes Ada's mother in, in not very favorable terms. Um, and at the at the end of the at the end of the book, at the at the conclusion of the book, what she what she summarizes Ada li Ada's life in uh, rather aptly, perhaps, um, and says that Ada's time was too brief, her health too brittle. Um, for such achievements, um, you know, going on beyond what she already did. Uh, subject from the age of seven to all kinds of disorders, some perhaps nervous in origin, but others as specific as cholera, watched over with minute and often severe scrutiny, married at 19 and a mother at 20, burning to utilize rare talents, but perpetually interrupted by the demands of a self-indulgent invalid who was to outlive her by nearly eight years, petted and lectured like a child by her domineering mother and paternal husband, and in the background of all this cheriasco, fascinating and disturbing of her father's renown and his satanic guilt, could anything more be needed to ensure that her brilliant gifts would be frustrated by immature judgment? She was born a hundred years too soon. Had she lived in the 20th century, her father's sins would have not seemed infernal. Her mother's virtues would not have imposed a neurotic and resentful celibacy. Her passion for mathematical sciences might have been channeled into a satisfying career of Instead of descending to the uh, puerile ambition of outwitting book bookmakers, her illnesses would almost certainly have been better diagnosed and treated. Her death from cancer might have been averted or at any rate not turned into a long, drawn-out agony supposed to be inflicted by God for the salvation of her soul. Um, it is an odd, indeed a startling thought, that she might actually have been allowed to know Byron. Um, so her father uh, died uh, at 36 as well, kind of, kind of fateful sort of coincidence, um, and she never met him. Uh, she was allowed at age 20 to view his portrait, um, and throughout many of her letters you can see there's a kind of ambivalence about her father, I think, realizing his genius, realizing though the pain that he had caused her mother, and so she was caught in a very difficult um, situation. Um, Doris Langley Moore alludes here to um, Ada Lovelace's gambling. This is something that is a part of her final years that is probably one of the least well understood parts of her life. Um, and um, unfortunately, there is not a lot of clarity uh, to be found in the biographies. Uh, you know, we know that she incurred gambling debts. Uh, we don't know precisely what led to that. Her, certainly, her. Uh, despite being a, a wealthy woman in principle, she was actually uh, allowed only a rather small allowance by her husband and was expected to make due on that. And so she had some financial deprivation. She also had these interests in mathematics and and who knows what else. Um, so unfortunately, that doesn't get sorted out as we read through the biographies. But. Uh, certainly, uh, this is. Um, I enjoyed this. This is this is an enjoyable book to read. It, it, I learned a lot about not so much about Ada Lovelace and her mathematical computing ideas, but more so her life, her times, her family, um, and and so it's it's you know certainly worth reading. Um, so that biography, however, does not get into her. Um, sort of mathematical talents. The Doris Langley Moore concedes she doesn't have a basis for judging those, so she doesn't really get into that very much. Um, after that, we start to see a, a few books that um, that do try and address Ada Lovelace's place in mathematics and computer science. And one of those books, um, I have a, a library-bound copy that just kind of looks like that, you know, so you, nothing interesting there to look at. But this is a book called *The Calculating Passion of Ada Byron* uh, by Joan Baum, and this was published in 1986. And it's actually kind of hard to find. I mean, it's it's not really. I had to get it through interlibrary loan, and, and comes to us from uh, Bemidji State University, actually. So good good for them. And um, it's one of those books that's kind of expensive when you look for it on Amazon and stuff. But it's actually a nice book. It's actually a a, a book that focuses much more on Ada Lovelace 
from a computing and calculating point of view and, and talks about her training in mathematics. And this is really interesting because as a, as a wealthy aristocratic young woman, she didn't go to school. I mean, you know, girls didn't go to school in these days. But she did have tutors. She had a series of tutors in mathematics and other subjects. And um, uh, Lady Byron was quite enthusiastic about Ada learning mathematics. And, um, and this book kind of talks about that in, um, in, in, you know, in, in clear terms, whereas the Doris Langley Moore do book doesn't get into that quite as much. But um, this book makes the point that mathematics was first for Lady Byron a mode of moral discipline. Um, and accordingly, she arranged a full study schedule for her child, emphasizing music and arithmetic, um, music to be put to the purposes of social service, arithmetic to train the mind. And later in her life, Ada Lovelace actually kind of alternated between doing work in mathematics and, and then studying the harp and, and actually singing. Uh, so she had significant interest in music as well. Um, and then we get into uh, some of Lady Byron's methods of educating uh, Ada, even as a young child of eight, nine, ten years old. Uh, Lady Byron's education of Ada turned on rewards and punishments, the latter including solitary confinement, lying still, and written apology. Um, lessons ranged with breaks from morning until dinner, uh, but study might be extended if lessons were not done with alacrity and docility. Um, and so, again, this is where one has to ask what were the prevailing practices of the day. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it certainly, though, from a modern perspective, sounds like a rather rigid sort of approach to education. Um, we learn in this book and various other books, most other books mention this, that one of Ada's mathematics tutors was Augustus de Morgan, who is a pretty significant figure in mathematics. We know him from de Morgan's theorem, for example. And he had, um, he was recruited to serve as Ada's tutor. He did not do it for pay, however, or as a job. He did it, I think, in, you know, as, as kind of a favor to the family and was rewarded with wild game, you know, so it was one of those kinds of arrangements. But he had um, a, 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 a and their correspondence has been preserved, and this comes up in some of the other biographies. Um, and so it's important, um, it's an important point of reference to really get at the question of how capable was Ada Lovelace, because there's controversy about that. Some people suggest, no, she couldn't do very much, and um, uh, others, you know, take to differ. And so maybe listening to Augustus de Morgan would be good here, because he was the actual tutor. And so what he says, he wrote um, that um, uh, he wrote a letter uh, that um, summarized his view of, of Ada's capabilities. And he, he compared her to uh, Mary Somerville, who was a, an, another woman who was a little older than Ada Lovelace and, and famous as a, as a, as a mathematician, um, and, and said that you know, her intellect was superior even to Mrs. Somerville's. And, um, and, and he wrote that he had never expressed his opinion of Ada directly to her, but that he was indeed impressed by her original mathematical mind. And then in De Morgan's words, what he said was, I feel bound to tell you that the power of thinking, which Lady Lovelace has always shown from the beginning of my correspondence with her, with her, has been something so utterly out of the common way for any beginner, man or woman, that this power must be duly considered by her friends with reference to the question whether they should urge or check her obvious determination to try to not only reach, but to get beyond the present bounds of knowledge. And so, um, De Morgan goes on in this letter to say that had she been allowed to study at Cambridge, she would not have been first wrangler. That is sort of winning a prize in mathematics for doing well in an exam. But, but that, that has to be understood as De Morgan's own criticism of Cambridge and, and the state of mathematics there, where, um, where it kind of revolved on doing well in exams and it wasn't really a place for creative thinking and things like that. So, so De Morgan appears to have a very positive opinion of Ada Lovelace's abilities. And, um, um, and, and what we see in that correspondence and what De Morgan points, points out is that Ada Lovelace was constantly asking about first principles. And, and going back to the foundations of 
um, ideas and why is this so or what if this wasn't so and you know from my own experience that you know I think that's the sign of a, a very um, I mean, someone who's going to do well in a subject is someone who is willing to question those kind of first principles and isn't afraid to ask those questions. And so, um, so this book does a good job of laying out her mathematical background, and it also then goes on and does a very kind of detailed discussion of the, the notes in this paper, and, and that's a really useful thing to, to be able to see. And so, uh, so, so this is, a, 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 I fear, a somewhat overlooked but interesting, very interesting book. Um, another biography that I read uh, is, has a rather kind of foreboding. This is a book by, from MIT Press says um, Ada, A Life and Legacy by Dorothy Stein. It's kind of uh, um, And the, the library edition I have is even more kind of, you know, it, it's just that. So there's not much to look at there. But then the published version is just a black cover. But anyway, the Dorothy Stein book is an interesting one because this is, a, this is one of the books that takes kind of a negative view, a dismissive view of Ada's talents. Um, and, you know, that you know, we should listen to that and, and be willing to consider the, 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 that point of view. But it does make some other points that I think are quite interesting um, about Ada Lovelace and her life. And this is really one of the first places where we see that um, uh, Lady Byron has often been criticized for, for carrying on this voluminous co correspondence about her relationship with Lord Byron and sort of making this case against him. And in the Dorothy Stein biography, uh, the case is made that it was very difficult for a woman to separate from her husband uh, in this time, in that time, and to keep custody of a child. And so that um, Lady Byron was trying to do that and by writing all of these letters that were sent to many, many different people. Some, some people have argued, well, this is just kind of a smear campaign against Lord Byron and so forth. Others, Dorothy Stein among them, argue that she was trying to lay a foundation for keeping Ada as her child. Now, whether or not Lord Byron really would have fought to keep custody of Ada is, uh, I mean, I think many say that that wouldn't have been very likely, but all the same the possibility existed. And one of the factors and in, in, in issues in Ada's childhood is that her mother created this impression that her father was going to have her kidnapped, that there were these dark mysterious forces out there of people coming to get her and take her away. And so here you have this child, absent father, distant mother, worried about abduction to strange and foreign lands. Um, it's, I mean, that's tough. That's, that's, that's a hard reality as a child. Um, and it, 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 it preys upon natural fears of abandonment and, and, and questions about parents and so forth. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, a very, um, uh, I mean, we see a sad childhood, a lonely, fearful, uh, strict uh, childhood. Uh, which, which is sad, and, and with some sickness, unfortunately. Um, and so the, um, the, the, the Dorothy Stein biography does do some other um, interesting things, and it, 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 so it is somewhat, it, it takes a position that is somewhat more dismissive of Ada's mathematical abilities, and, and it makes that case by using the letters from De Morgan and pointing out, well, look, she's asking these really simple questions. She can't be very good at math. And I, when I read that first, I found it really frustrating because what do we say when we're teaching? We say there's no such thing as a dumb question, right? And that's true. I mean, and, and students ask questions for lots of reasons. And especially questions about first principles, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't understand the first principles. It means they want to know more about why we believe these kinds of first principles. Um, and I think to, to, to sort of diminish Ada Lovelace's accomplishments because she was an inquisitive student who wasn't afraid to ask questions, I think it's just, it's just wrong. I think it's just unfair and it, it, it sort of, it, it, it sort of uh, reinforces the argument that some students have like, yeah, you shouldn't ask questions because if you do, people are going to make fun of you. And so, um, so I think that's kind of an unfortunate aspect of this discussion. But um, she does make some interesting uh, 
points about Ada's life after the Manabria paper, and, and, and actually talks about in more depth than, I, than I've seen anywhere else, um, Ada Lovelace's interest in working with other scientists beyond Charles Babbage, in particular uh, Michael Faraday, a uh, great physicist, experimental physicist, um, interestingly enough a man who did not know much mathematics at all, um, and yet is regarded as a, a, a premier you know, figure in the history of science. Um, Michael Faraday was, um, was not uh, able to work with Ada Lovelace, um, and I think that may have been in part his age and in part sort of his own concerns about the dangerousness of what he, what he did with chemicals and electricity and things like this. And, and, but Ada began to acquire a great interest in sort of electricity, electromagnetic phenomena, um, this, this after the Manabria paper, um, including topics like mesmerism, and phrenology, we feel the shape of a head and um, use magnetic forces to sort of cure illnesses and things like this, and, and talk towards the end of her life about trying to discover a sort of calculus of the nervous system. Uh, and this is, you know, one of the things that we won't know where that would have gone, of course, but had she had more than 36 years, might have been a rather interesting, uh, interesting thing to see. Um, and so um, she also talks in, in quite a bit of depth here about Ada's work in providing some notes for a paper by her husband, uh, Lord Lovelace, um, on the effect of, I believe, heat or energy on the growth of plants and agriculture. And this is just kind of fascinating. This is not something that is discussed in many other places. And she clearly kind of got into this, and, and there's some interesting discussion of some of her comments of that article that's not nearly as well known as the Manabria article, but it is some work she did. And so, um, so the Dorothy Stein biography, um, it's one, people who tend to diminish Ada's contributions in the Manabria paper tend to refer to this. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it, it's interesting, though, there, there are other uh, aspects of her life that are described here in more detail than in other places. And so I think it's, 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 it's I'm glad I read it. Um, I, I think I may differ a little bit on her interpretation of, of, of Ada's mathematical abilities and things like that, but uh, all the same, I, 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 I was glad to have read that book. Now, as we, as we march along here, um, we, we come across another book from uh, originally published in 1992 and then a, a revised edition, actually an abridged edition, which I have here, kind of heartbreaking to me that I have the abridged edition of this. Um, it's called Ada the Enchantress of Numbers, Prophet of the Computer Age by Betty Alexandra Toole. And you will guess from the title here of the book that this is a fairly sympathetic portrait of Ada Lovelace, and it is. Um, and it's a very, I actually really like this book, um, I guess not just not just because I agree with the point of view, perhaps, but because of the way it's done. It, it introduces, um, it, use, it relies a lot on her letters. And there's a short sort of summary of what the letters tell us, followed by excerpts from letters or complete letters. And so if you're interested in reading the correspondence of, of Ada Lovelace, um, this is a good place to go. The unabridged edition actually has more. Um, this is the abridged edition. The unabridged has more, but either one of them give you a real nice flavor for Ada Lovelace um, in her own words. And this goes from her childhood towards the end of her life. And and you know, so one interesting uh, there's a there's a letter here that Ada wrote to her mother uh, when she was about eight years old. Um, and I'll read a little bit here. Um, my dear Mammy, since last night I have been thinking more about the flying, and I can find no difficulty in the motion or distension of the wings. I have already thought of a new way of a way of fixing them onto the shoulders, and I think that they might perhaps be made of oil silk. And if that does not answer, I must try what I can do with feathers. Um, I, I know you will laugh at what I am going to say, but I am going to take the exact patterns of a bird's wing in proportion to the size of its body, and then I am immediately going to set about making a pair of paper wings of exactly the same size as the birds in proportion to my size. Um, and she goes on talking about making wings, and 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 she is dreaming of flying, and and it's 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 wonderful, um, and it's uh, it's it's rather sad in a way though because at the end of this kind of dreamy letter she goes back to reality and talks about um, 
She says, Miss Stamp desires me to say that at present she is not particularly pleased with me on account of some very foolish conduct yesterday about a simple thing, and which she said was not only foolish but showed a spirit of inattention, and though today she has not had reason to be dissatisfied with me on the whole, yet she says that she cannot directly efface the recollection of the past. Goodbye, your affectionate pigeon, A.A. A. Byron. And she's eight. And so first she's writing letters to her mother at eight, which I find kind of, you know, why isn't your mother there, first of all? And then she's speaking in this rather formal way about her own failings of behavior. Um, and But there are lots and lots of letters from the young Ada and then as she as she uh, you know as she is growing up and and it kind of samples through her life and includes some very delightful correspondence with with Charles Babbage um, and Charles Babbage um, Ada Lovelace met Charles Babbage in 1833 they remained friends up until nearly the time of her death um, and uh, and and they had an extensive correspondence and in a lot of this correspondence you hear Ada Lovelace inviting Babbage to visit or thanking him for visiting. So they spent a lot of time together, and that time together is not particularly well documented. You wouldn't be writing letters to someone who's right there with you. And so uh, that's one of the places where the biographies are, are a little silent. What was the kind of the, the nature of this relationship between Babbage and Lovelace? Um, I think it's clear it wasn't a romantic relationship, but it was a friendship, it was a collegial relationship, it was a relationship that at times had its ups and downs, but uh, certainly was an important part of her life, and I would venture to say a part of his life too. Um, and so one of the letters that she wrote to Babbage in 1843 while working on the Manabria paper uh, says uh, about one of the notes, Note B has plagued me to death, although I have made but little alteration to it. Such alterations as there are, however, happen to have been very tiresome and to have demanded minute consideration and very nice adjustments. It is a very excellent note. Uh, I wish you were as accurate and as much to be relied on as I am myself. You might often save me much trouble if you were, whereas you in reality add to my trouble not infrequently, and there is at any rate always the anxiety of doubting if you will not get me into a scrape even when you don't. By the way, I hope you do not take it upon yourself to alter any of my corrections. I must beg you not. They all have some very sufficient reason, and you have made a pretty mess and confusion in one or two places, which I will show you sometime, where you have ventured into my manuscript to insert or alter a phrase or word and have utterly muddled the sense. I could not conceive at first in one or two places what had happened to my sentence, though I soon saw they were patchwork and not my own, and found it so on referring to the manuscript. I fear you will think this is a very cross letter. Never mind, I am a good little thing after all. Yours ever, A.A.L. And so any idea that she was Babbage's secretary, I mean, your sec secretaries don't write like this, right? So, um, uh, so this is... Um, uh, I enjoy the, I enjoyed this book quite a lot because this is you get to see Ada Lovelace through her letters her personality I think starts to shine through in a letter to her husband uh, uh, William Lord Lovelace um, 1844 uh, she was visiting the Cross residence um, and uh, apparently a rather eccentric family and John Cross is alleged to have been a romantic interest, also have gotten her into gambling and so forth, so there's a complicated subtext here perhaps that would develop later. But, um, but she says um, to her husband uh, while visiting the Crosses, uh, finding no symptoms of either breakfast or cloth being laid or of human beings, I have sat down to write to you in my shawl and boa in their very cold sitting room. I was down at nine, having been told there would be a breakfast. We all sat up reading and talking philosophy till one o'clock last night. I suppose that is the secret of the doll this morning. My head is very muzzy this morning uh, from that cause, I think, and I shall take the liberty this evening of calling my hosts to a recollection of time. The droll thing was that we were discussing the metaphysics of time and space, and in so doing we forgot real time and space. And the letter goes on, but the... I just there's there's a real engaging personality there I think that uh, that we can really see in, in this book so so the Ada the Enchantress of Numbers by Betty Alexander Toole I think it's a it's a nice collection of her letters that um, uh, I, I really feel her own words she she needs to be presented in her own words I think to really be understood and so I 
strongly uh, recommend that book. Um, so we go on. There are more books. Um, so, so 1999, we see uh, a book, um, the, Bride of, the Bride of Science by uh, Benjamin Woolley. And this is a book, notice the subtitle here, Romance, Reason, and Byron's Daughter. So this is a book, again, that is a bit more focused on Ada Lovelace as the daughter of Lord Byron and as being a kind of um, symbol of a, a change, sort of the, the, the conflict between um, uh, the romanticism and, and, and reason or m kind of more empirical view of the world and, and how the book kind of tries to lay out the, the, the premise that Ada Lovelace was uh, kind of caught between those two worlds, uh, perhaps represented her father, the great romantic, her mother, the more pragmatic, mathematically minded. And so this conflict is sort of waged through Ada Lovelace. And it's an interesting book. Um, it, again, it's a book that talks a lot about Ada Lovelace's family, particularly um, her sort of half-sister, if you will, the allegedly illegitimate child, illegitimate daughter of Lord Byron, Medora. Um, and um, but it does it does talk about her life as well, um, and so describes some of her childhood dreams of flight and so forth, um, and um, uh, also talks quite a bit about Ada's relationship with Mary Somerville, uh, a mathematician, a, a woman, uh, a, perhaps ten or fifteen years older than Ada, but who became a, a great influence on her and actually was, I believe, the source of her introduction to Charles Babbage. And so again, we see some aspects of her life here sort of fleshed out um, and, um, you know, I think perhaps putting her in her time and sort of positioning her relative to the larger so social and intellectual forces that were at play at that time. So this, this was an interesting, interesting book. Um, so um, in the same year, I believe, uh, there was a, a book that, um, a, uh, called Ada's Algorithm that appeared uh, first in England, and then this is, I believe, the cover of the United States edition, How Lord Byron's Daughter Ada Lovelace Launched the Digital Age. So she's still Lord Byron's daughter. But um, launching the digital age, clearly a, perhaps a somewhat sympathetic portrait. And I believe the British edition had this as a subtitle, which I found kind of, meh. Uh, How Ada Lovelace Started the Computer Age, a Female Genius. So she's not just a genius here, she's a female genius. And I would not dispute her genius that we need to describe it as a female genius. I, I'm not sure about that. Um, here again, another cover, a female genius. How Ada Lovelace, Lord Byron's daughter, started the computer age. James Essinger. And so this um, this book um, uh, appeared. Uh, actually, it uh, I may have misspoken on the publication date. It, 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 the, the, United, the edition in the United States uh, appeared just in 2014, so it's a relatively recent book. It, it takes a very kind of positive view of Ada Lovelace and credits her with, you know, having a lot of influence on computing and kind of goes through the highlights of her life. To be honest, by the time I read this book, I didn't feel like there was anything that I hadn't already seen um, elsewhere. But certainly if, you know, if you were just going to pick a biography and kind of a short biography to read about Ada Lovelace and you were interested in her computing work, this isn't a bad one. Um, this isn't a bad one. I think um, uh, get the edition that does not have a female genius on it, if you can. Uh, the retitled Ada's Algorithm in the United States, I believe. Um, and so this is still a, this is a fairly recent book, at least in the United States, and um, is, I believe, still in print. Um, and so easy to get. Um, and then there's an even more recent um, book, uh, called Lady Byron and Her Daughters. This came out in 2015, and this is by Julia Marcus. And this is, um, again, the library edition is kind of not as exciting looking, but that's Lady Byron, um, and her daughters are Ada Lovelace and Medora Lee. Uh, Medora is the, again, sort of allegedly illegitimate offspring of Lord Byron and his half-sister. Um, 
And so Lady Byron, uh, at the same time Ada was working on the Manabria paper, actually, launched this effort to bring Medora into her family. And certainly one wonders, was this intended as kind of a distraction to, to Ada and her work? And, and Ada got tied up in this uh, trying to sort of bring Medora into the family and support her. And Medora herself had a very troubled life. Um, certainly the rumors about her parentage didn't help her. And uh, she, uh, I believe she ended up having a child by another sibling's husband, and so it's kind of a very messy, dramatic story. Um, this book, I have to say this book was frustrating. Um, this book is basically trying to rehabilitate Lady Byron and argues that, well, maybe she wasn't really a hypochondriac, maybe she was really sick, and, and, and sort of casts things in a way very favorable to Lady Byron. and. Unfortunately, I think the evidence in her own correspondence, Ada's correspondence, correspondence of many other people, suggests otherwise. Uh, she was a difficult, demanding woman who uh, controlled her daughter's life, Ada's life, for um, almost its entirety, um, and uh, certainly enlisted Ada's husband in that control. Ada's husband became kind of a father figure to her. Um, and and had a rather patronizing attitude towards Ada, and Lady Byron was certainly enabling that. So so I, I would take issue with a lot of this. I, I, the book is actually reasonably well, well written. The author writes pretty well. Um, I don't know that I, I I wasn't really compelled by its point of view, but you know we should hear all sides. So so I wanted to mention that as well. Um, one of an interesting thing to note is that Lady Byron was able to enlist Harriet Beecher Stowe, famous to American uh, audiences, I guess, as author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, I guess primarily that, but she wrote an article, the true story of Lady Byron's life, which was published in 1869. So this is after Ada is dead, um, long after Lord Byron is dead. She is still working on getting the story out. And so Lady Byron befriended Harriet Beecher Stowe, told the story of Lord Byron's infamy, which Harriet Beecher Stowe kind of presented to the public in uh, uh, this, this article in 1869. And so in some ways this Julia Marcus book is maybe kind of, you know, maybe we should pair them together a bit as, as, as kind of trying to rehabilitate um, Ada, or not Ada, Lady Byron. Um, now, there, are, there are, Ada Lovelace is discussed in many other books about computing and so forth, and I just wanted to mention one fairly recent book that, that's a, actually a pretty good overview of the history of computing. This is called The Innovator by Walter, Walter Isaacson. There's a chapter on Ada Lovelace here, uh, as well as, you know, you see Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and, oh, it's Alan Turing. So any book that includes Ada Lovelace and Alan Turing on the cover, I'm going to be okay with. And so this is a, you know, if you want like a 30-page summary of Ada Lovelace and why she matters for computing, this is actually a pretty good source. So I'd recommend this. Um, other places where we see Ada Lovelace um, entering sort of popular culture, um, there's a recent book from 2015 that I love. This is one of my favorite books about computing. I've talked about that in another video. Um, but this is The Thrilling Love Adventures of Lovelace and Babbage by Sidney Padua. And this, this is a graphic novel that talks about the analytical engine and Ada Lovelace and Babbage and their work and life together. And it also includes some sort of speculative imaginings of what if the analytical engine had actually been built. Um, but it's done in a way that includes a lot of um, footnotes and citations and scholarship and provides a lot of actually nice um, information about the analytical engine. And if you look online, you can actually see that Sidney Padua has um, created some visualizations of a working analytical engine, which are wonderful, and some illustrations of what it would have looked like if it had been built. Um, and so this is, um, uh, this, this is a very enjoyable book, and I think it's a nice book because it actually focuses on Lovelace and Babbage. And, what, and what's interesting is that for all of the books that are out there about Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage, many of them don't intersect that much. 
I mean, um, especially the books uh, that focus on Lord Byron and the family issues and stuff, Charles Babbage is kind of a secondary figure. Charles Babbage's books about Charles Babbage and so forth, he had such a, a far-flung intellectual life that many of the books about him don't uh, really talk that much about Ada Lovelace and there's no place really where we see them together where their relationship is the focus of the book save here perhaps and and granted some of it is imagined uh, but it's nice to kind of see them together in one place because clearly they were important to each other towards the end of her life um, Ada tried to make Charles Babbage her executor of his estate um, which her Lady Byron squashed. Lady Byron also cut Charles Babbage off from visiting towards the end of Lady, Ada Lovelace's life. I mean, it's a, a sad ending for Ada Lovelace and, um, uh, you know, sad to see. Um, we start to see Ada Lovelace appearing in, in fiction, movies, TV shows, things like that. One, uh, I haven't studied all of that, but one book that I did read um, is called Lord Byron's Novel, The Evening Land by John Crowley. And this is kind of an interesting book. This is more so focused again on Lord Byron. We can't get away from Lord Byron apparently, but it, it, it hypothesizes the existence of an unknown novel by Lord Byron that Ada Lovelace has essentially hidden in a way that I won't describe so I don't spoil it for you, but some modern day researchers uncover it and they find this manuscript by Lord Byron with notes by his daughter, Ada Lovelace. And so the book tries to do a few things. First, it tries to write a book as if, it tries to write a novel as if Lord Byron would write it, which is kind of a challenge in itself. And then it provides notes in a way hopefully consistent with the style of Ada Lovelace. And I would say it doesn't do bad at that. And it also provides this kind of more modern email correspondence between various figures uh, as they sort of unravel the mystery of this novel, of this uh, Lord Byron novel. So, so this is, I enjoyed this. This is an interesting book. It doesn't tell us too much about Ada Lovelace, but she's certainly an important part of it. And it does talk about aspects of her life, actually, that, um, you know, kind of clearly the author has done uh, his homework. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to, to mention this. Um, and then a sign that maybe Ada Lovelace is really alive is is what? Um, young adult fiction. So guess what? Um, there is a series now of detective novels for young adults. I think these are probably targeted for like 10, 11 year old children. Um, and the series is called um, the, um, the, 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 the Wollstonecraft Detective Agency. And volume one is the case of the missing moonstone. And uh, this is um, Ada Lovelace and Mary Shelley are paired together as kids. Now, Mary Shelley was the author of Frankenstein, actually somewhat older than Ada Lovelace, but, you know, you can manipulate stuff with fiction. The author's really clear about that, that he's kind of changed the timeline. But they're young girls, you know, probably 11, 12 years old, and they form a detective agency and aided by the young Charles Dickens uh, solve crimes. And it's charming, and it gives Ada, I, I, I mean, I, I actually read this. I read this, I read this entire book, um, and it, I enjoyed it. Um, it gave Ada a kind of happy, interesting childhood that she no doubt didn't have. Um, and uh, it does introduce some, uh, it includes some information about the actual historical figures, and so, um, you know, it, uh, it, 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 it tries to do its part to educating um, you know, young young readers about Ada Lovelace um, and and her um, uh, her life and times, and so volume that's the first that's the first one. Uh, the second volume, uh, the Girl in Gray, the case of the Girl in Gray, um, and then there's a third one in the series coming out. So Ada Lovelace is now a, a figure in a young adult de detective fiction series. What more what more could you ask for? Um, there's also, a, a, I guess, a, a book maybe for slightly younger children uh, called Ada Byron Lovelace and the Thinking Machine. And this is a very, um, a, a very, uh, a very, actually very nice uh, book uh, that, that um, kind of lavishly illustrated that sort of 
focuses on the highlights of uh, her life. Um, this is Ada as a baby with mother and father in a rare moment of harmony. Uh, Lord Byron was apparently quite fond of dogs, uh, by the way. So, um, uh, and uh, you know, there's there's Ada Lovelace and her mother escaping the scandalous Lord Byron and so forth. Um, but, uh, it, it talks about her her love of flying machines and her beloved cat Puff. And so, I mean, so this is a nice, you know, this is a nice, enjoyable, interesting book that kind of summarizes the high points of her life. It doesn't obviously get into technical details about um, about her work, but certainly tells us who Charles Charles Babbage was and why she was interest why he was interesting to her, and hints a bit about the work that she did. So so I think this is just kind of wonderful. I mean, I think I think you know having something like this available, uh, you know, so that. Uh, uh, children or even adults can have a very sort of quick idea of who Ada Lovelace was. Um, uh, I, I think is is just uh, is just marvelous. Um, and so there are I, I've noticed on Amazon there are more Ada Lovelace books on the way out for young adults especially. And so you know maybe she's found a, a place um, uh, there that that you know certainly will be important. I mean I think it's important that. You know, college students, university students talk about Ada Lovelace, but I think, you know, our role models are, I think, defined earlier in our lives. And so maybe if some of these books kind of bring Ada Lovelace to life for younger readers, I think that's wonderful. Um, so, wow. So that's an, a bunch of books about Ada Lovelace. Um, there, there is more. Um, there's a lot that can be read, um, a lot that can be learned. And I think, I think the important point might be that for whatever someone might think about her, uh, she is a part of our landscape now, a part of our computing landscape for certain, also a part of our cultural and historical landscape, and needs to be taken seriously. Um, uh, her, her correspondence and letters, her papers are still in the process of being organized, but, 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 uh, but hopefully, um, you know, the, the, the more complete collections and organizing and categorizations of her voluminous correspondence will, will bring more to light about her life and maybe we'll get that one definitive biography that I, that I was hoping to find at the start of this. So um, I hope this has given you some good ideas and wow if you've, if you've stayed for the whole exposition here I, I thank you for that and uh, we'll talk to you soon.